The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's recent visit to a controversial shrine to Japan's war dead prompted swift rebukes from South Korea and China, who accused Abe of trying to obscure atrocities committed in their countries by Imperial Japanese forces during the World War II era. Abe has made no secret of his desire to revise his nation's 1947 pacifist constitution in favor of a more assertive Japan, complete with greater military might. We'll look today at Japan's historic place in the region and how Mr. Abe's more muscular posture might play in East Asia and beyond. Our guest today is an assistant professor of history at Marquette University, where his research and teaching focus on Japan and East Asia. He was last in Japan earlier this week. Michael Wirt, welcome to International Focus. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Well, maybe we could start with uh, sort of a, a Japanese history 101 and, and just walk us through the, uh, maybe in, in a few brief seconds, the, the last century of Japanese history. Sure. Well, if we start from about the 17th century to the Meiji Restoration of 1868, which is generally seen as the beginning of modern Japan, Japan was dominated by a samurai uh, minority elite, so about 8% of the population controlled all of Japan. Um, and their capital city was Edo, which is now Tokyo. And the last samurai regime was overthrown by another group of samurai in 1868 and 1869 during the Meiji Restoration and what is often called the Boshin War. And when that happened, the samurai who won essentially uh, got rid of the status system and tried to create a modern, what they saw as a westernized uh, nation state. So they became oligarchs. They eventually created a uh, constitutional monarchy. And what they had to do was really promote the emperor as the kind of figurehead of uh, Japanese identity. So that's really where late 19th century and early 20th century finds its focus in Japan. OK. And, uh, and for, for those of us uh, other than uh, Toshiro Mofune fans, uh, <laughs> what do we mean by samurai? Samurai. So they were a hereditary elite. They were warriors. Um, and their status goes all the way back to, oh gosh, maybe the 13th century or so. But by the 17th and 18th centuries, a lot of the samurai are essentially sword-wearing paper pushers. They're bureaucrats. They're the technocrats. Um, they have their position because they were born into their position. And in society, they were you know, looked up to by all of the other statuses. Um, they weren't always noble people, as we might see in some of the Japanese popular culture, like the, or something like the Last Samurai. You know, a lot of times they were poor. You know, they went around begging or selling swords or something like that. But they were in control of the government for the most part. So, uh, you know, this this first uh, stab at setting up sort of a more modern nation state mm -hmm. happens after the the Meiji era, and then what happens after that? So after the Meiji Restoration of 1868, they set up an oligarchy. And what they want to do is they want to kind of establish their own economic stability in East Asia. And so they see a variety of threats around them, Russia being one of them, but also a weakening China and Korean Peninsula. So what they try to do is they engage in a kind of gunboat uh, diplomacy of sorts with all of these uh, countries, but with um, China in particular. They wanted to stabilize the Korean Peninsula because they were the, the buffer between Japan and the rest of East Asia. And so that gets them into a series of wars with both China in 1894 and 95, the Sino-Japanese War. And then in 1904 and 1905 with the Russo-Japanese War, both wars that Japan won. And with those victories, Japan really comes into its own as a kind of imperialist country, uh, forming colonies around itself. And so this, this brings us up to uh, sort of the years 
pre-World War II? Yes, absolutely. Um, so essentially what's happening in the early 20th century is Japan is trying to stabilize itself uh, economically. It's trying to stable, it's stabilize itself uh, politically. Um, it's trying to uh, quiet any domestic opponents that it might have. Um, and it's trying to, again, secure itself in the region. And it sees itself as being betrayed by the so-called white countries, the European countries, who set up an international law system that benefits them, but doesn't necessarily uh, benefit the Japanese, or at least that's in the mindset of the Japanese leadership uh, at the time. So, uh, you know, we can sort of fast forward through mm -hmm. the, the sure, narrative sure. of World War II. Sure, sure, sure. And then talk a little bit about sort of the, the impact of that experience on Japanese society. Uh, the impact of the, of the Asia-Pacific War, well, of course, it was devastating, not only in terms of uh, the physical infrastructure of Japan, but also on the psyche of many Japanese. They were, they were tired, they were despondent, and they were ready to be done with the war. Um, of course, there were many Japanese who were sorry that they lost, um, but more than that, people were just, you know, tired, and the country was absolutely devastated. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people dead, and most of the large cities just completely destroyed. So it was an issue of how to rebuild, you know, how to rebuild infrastructure, how to rebuild a new national goal um, to pursue in the decades after World War II. And what about, you know, where the, the Japanese people really saw themselves in the world at that? Did it have an effect on that? I mean, that there, are, there are certainly examples in the history of, mm. of people who feel like, you know, they have a rightful sort of preeminent place in their region, and when, when they're denied it, it, it's just some cosmic injustice. Is that the case? Well, there? yeah, I mean, well, every Japanese person probably had their own opinion at the time, but certainly we could say that the that the confidence that came with modern Japanese government uh, after the Meiji Restoration, that Japan was going to stabilize the region and make itself a nice home for its economic prowess, that dream was destroyed. You know, the idea that they could dominate everyone around them had just been completely destroyed. Um, and so there was this effort to kind of say, well, where do we go from here? Um, obviously, we're not going to be an economic military, or I should say, we're not going to be a military power anymore, uh, but maybe we can turn to something else. And it was really the, the leadership, the early prime ministers, who said, you know, let's try to focus on building up the economy and not worry so much about building up the military anymore. Um, and in fact, in the post-war period, it's the United States that was trying to push Japan to rebuild its military, um, which the Japanese leadership was saying, no, we have this constitution that doesn't let us do that. And so in giving up their military prowess, they focused on building up their economy. And they did so quite successfully into the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, of course. Well, uh, you know, you referenced that post-war economy, or I'm sorry, constitution from uh, 1947. Let me just read what is probably the most uh, newsworthy article mm -hmm. in that constitution sure. these days, Article 9, which says, quote, aspiring sincerely to be an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. And to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. Is that, that's Article 9. That's of, Article of the, 9. The so-called peace constitution, yes. And so how has that played out? And, and why is there tension these days about it? Well, um... As I said, initially it was the United States that saw Japan as its key ally in East Asia, especially against the U.S.'s fight against communism. So in fact, they wanted Japan to build up a military, but they have this Article 9, so what do you do? And basically they finagled it. They don't have uh, an army, a navy, and an air force, but they have an army-like self-defense force, a navy-like self-defense force, and of course they have uh, jets and such. So they have self-defense forces, which are essentially a military, but they're, they're not called a military. They're called a self-defense force. 
Um, and for a long time, Japan had spent a lot of money on its uh, military budget, in fact, one of the largest uh, in the world. And they were, of course, buying a lot of military equipment from the United States. So they have a non-military military, military uh, if you will. And, and what about uh, statutorily how it can be used? Well, uh, Japan is not allowed to engage in any armed conflict whatsoever. Um, when they do, when they have sent some kind of troops abroad, it's for humanitarian efforts. Um, but they are not even supposed to defend themselves. They have, uh, for example, I think it was uh, during the war in Iraq that uh, maybe it was Canadian soldiers that were assigned to defend the Japanese self-defense forces. Um, but even that move was very controversial in Japan and East Asia because this was seen as um, an effort by Japan to remilitarize to a certain extent. But in the past wars, like the Gulf War, for example, what Japan has done is simply given financial aid, which is, of course has been criticized by Japan's allies, you know, saying, oh, you're buying your way out of just sending troops. So it's kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of stuck in a way. But, uh, you know, that, that revisiting of mm. Article 9 yes, and the, the status of, of Japan's military posture is really a fault line in Japanese society now, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the politicians who want to revise the Constitution want to revise Article 9 in such a way that they can uh, create what they see as a normal country, and a normal country to them is a country that has a military um, and participates in you know military activities uh, abroad. And so, getting rid of Article Nine or revising it to making it essentially meaningless uh, as it stands now is their goal. Now, there are some um, people who point out that Article 9 is vague enough, uh, usefully ambiguous, if you will, that they can do things uh, to get around um, Article 9. For example, they have the self-defense forces, which was one way that they got around Article 9. So some people think that if you want to create a military, you, you simply uh, have a very uh, liberal reading of Article 9. But the, the hardline conservatives in Japan, I think they want to get rid of it altogether. Now, Japanese people in general uh, do not favor getting rid of Article 9. Um, so getting rid of Article 9 is, is going to be a tough haul for conservative politicians in Japan. Well, and uh, you know, is, is there any generational aspect to that? I mean, does it matter whether you lived through the, the Pacific War or not in terms of where you come down on this issue? Typically? I think so. My impression of Japan, and certainly anecdotally, is that older people who were either born during the war or, of course, uh, participated in the war itself are very much against uh, revising the Constitution and having a military because they've experienced the war and the tragedies that go along with it and the arrogance that goes along with war. Um, so in general, for, again, this is just my impression, is that older people are against this. While younger people haven't experienced war at all and so they're more willing to see what it's like to perhaps have a military. Uh, but even among the younger generation, in general, people are against um, trying to have a military and get rid of Article 9. Well, uh, that brings us to the current government, uh, led by Mr. Abe, mm -hmm. and uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, that scenario when we come back. First, sure. we'll take a short break. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about Japan and the current Shinzo Abe government. So one of the things that uh, certainly brought unwelcome attention on, uh, on the Abe government recently was his visit to a very controversial sh a shrine. Can you tell us a little bit about what that shrine means and why it's the third rail politically? Sure. The Yasukuni Shrine is a Shinto shrine that was built in 1869, uh, right after the Meiji Restoration, 
um, for the oligarchs, the Meiji oligarchs, to honor and celebrate their colleagues who died fighting the previous uh, samurai-dominated regime. And since that time, uh, throughout the first half of the 20th century, it was a Shinto shrine that was funded and run by the ministries of uh, the Army and ministries of Navy, uh, funded by the government, and was also deeply connected to the emperor and the imperial family. Uh, and so the, those are the three kind of legacies of uh, the Yasukuni shrine, a shrine to the war dead, connected to the military, and connected to the emperor. And uh, some, some of the people enshrined there then are, are people that uh, certainly others in the region might find less worthy of adulation. Is that right, absolutely. In uh, 1978, a newly appointed head priest of the Yasukuni Shrine, who was long time someone who wanted to see all of the so-called, in his mind, so-called war criminals enshrined at Yasukuni, uh, he had them enshrined there, uh, including the 14 Class A uh, war criminals. And that caused a lot of controversy at the time uh, inside of Japan, and of course since then has caused a lot of controversy in the region and, and even with Japan's allies such as the United States. So for a, uh, a Japanese leader to make a, a public visit to that shrine, I mean, what, how is it perceived, regardless of, of how the visitor may think he's, uh, he's, you know, the purpose of his visit. Right. There are several problems connected to Yasukuni Shrine. One is that it's a Shinto shrine. It's a religious shrine. And so when a prime minister visits Yasukuni, the question is, is he visiting as a private citizen and simply uh, engaging in his own religious freedom? Or is he visiting as a politician, as a public figure? Um, that's always been vague with previous prime ministers. But people in Japan have tried to sue the government, saying that there is clearly, under Article 20 of the Constitution, a separation of church and state. And for a prime minister to visit Yasukuni and perform the Shinto rituals to kind of worship the war dead there, who are enshrined as what are called kami, essentially divine beings, um, this is a breach of the Constitution in those people's minds. And the other issue, the more pressing issue, is that in going to Yasukuni Shrine, it is felt by people in the region that he is uh, celebrating those people who were guilty or found guilty of war crimes. Well, let me uh, just read a, a bit of an op-ed from a Korean newspaper following the visit, which says, quote, Buoyed by the nationalist mood sweeping Japanese society since Abe took the helm of the once pacifist nation, Right-wing politicians are regressing to a militarist path. As a result, the political situation of Northeast Asia is becoming shakier than ever. So, uh, is is there anything to this this regression to a militarist path? Do you think? Well, it depends who you ask. Um, certainly, the the kind of hawkish conservatives in the Japanese government uh, have always wanted to, you know, recreate the military, um, and they've always wanted to kind of uh, whitewash the Japanese uh, wartime legacy. So that's nothing new, although certainly in the last maybe 15 or 20 years, politicians have been uh, a lot bolder in letting those views be heard. Uh, and this includes not only visiting Yasukuni, but making claims that some of the wartime atrocities, such as the Nanjing Massacre or the existence of comfort women as sexual slaves, that these are all either fabrications or grossly exaggerated. Uh, and those views are certainly not mainstream. Indeed, the Japanese public is um, largely, you know, understanding of the fact that their country is guilty of a lot of atrocities in the region. But, um, and, and polls bear that out. However, gradually it seems that the Japanese public is more willing to accept a prime minister who visits uh, Yasukuni Shrine. And so critics have taken that as evidence that indeed Japan is moving to the political right, if you will, that they want to remilitarize. Well, and, and to what extent does the uh, sort of background environment lead to uh, those sorts of attitudes. I mean, certainly we've seen a, a 
huge spike in China, their traditional mm -hmm. military rivals uh, capacity in the region, some of the things that are going on in the South China Sea. Uh, so is this a, a natural reaction to what's perceived as just a threat? Well, you know, it's interesting. In the, in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, up to about 1985 or so, the other countries in the region never really loudly complained about visits to Yas Kuni. Um, China was, you know, not in a position economically to make those arguments, I think. And South Korea at the time was uh, benefiting from financial and economic help from Japan, so they certainly weren't going to be very loud in their criticism of Japan. But since the late 1980s and certainly the so-called lost decade of the 1990s, as Japanese economic power kind of dwindled a little bit in East Asia, and both South Korea and mainland China have become, you know, economic powerhouses, they've certainly felt, you know, bolder in voicing their criticisms uh, of Japan. And so some would say that politicians are reacting uh, to their neighbors. They feel that if they give in to Chinese demands to either remove the 14 war criminals from Yaskuni or stop visiting Yaskuni, that they're giving in to the demands of their neighbors. So there's this kind of, you know, who's going to make the first move and, and rectify all of this? Well, and, and you referenced the, the state of the economy. Now, mm -hmm. the, the first year of, of Mr. Abe's current government has actually been quite good economically, hasn't it? Absolutely, and that gives him a lot of confidence to visit Yaskuni, and his, his polls show that he's favored in Japan, I think uh, about 60 percent or so, um, which is really good for any politician. Um, and so he feels that he can now do the things that he wants to do other than economics, and that is to revisit the issue of Japan's wartime past. He has long wanted to uh, see a revision of history textbooks to kind of play down a lot of the atrocities of the Asia-Pacific War. Um, in fact, he belongs to a group of Diet members who have that uh, goal as, as one of their long-term uh, aims as a group. So, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but, mm -hmm. th but there is perhaps a, a connection then between the sort of economic confidence and sense of well-being and an expectation of where Japan should be in the region and in the world, isn't it? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think some of those politicians see Japan not only as an economic powerhouse in the region, but more and more a, perhaps a military powerhouse in the region. Um, especially with uh, a growing China. Uh, in fact, some scholars think that what Abe was doing with Yaskuni this uh, past couple weeks was to purposely anger China so that he can create a kind of monster uh, so that he can, you know, pursue his goals of revising the Constitution. So he can say, hey, look, you know, China, look how, uh, you know, aggressive they are. We really need to defend ourselves more by having a military. Well, and the Chinese recently obliged him with their essentially no-fly zone oh, that they absolutely. overlaid over <laughs> uh, the region. So. Absolutely. So uh, how do U.S. relations play into this? Well, uh, there have been congressmen who've been against the visits to Yas Kuni for a long time, since the 1980s. Um, but those voices seem to be increasing a little bit uh, in recent years, uh, especially this, uh, this last time. Um, they, they're kind of stuck in that they don't want to put too much pressure on Japan because they need Japan. They need the uh, you know, American bases in Japan. Japan is still their ally in East Asia, especially against a rising China. Well, and as you said, I mean, the U.S. has is, is sort of leaned on Japan historically to, to <laughs> take a bigger military role. Absolutely. Right? So there's kind of a slap on the wrist, um, but nothing too aggressive uh, in terms of telling them to, to stop doing this. So looking ahead, I mean, what, what are some sort of signposts along the way in terms of, of where that center of gravity within the, the Japanese body politic might be shifting? Yeah. Well, geez, if I knew that, uh, <laughs> I'd be working for the government. But uh, no, it, it's tough to say. I mean, going forward, I mean, one of the issues is regarding historical memory, what can Japan do to rectify its relationship with its neighbors? 
And one suggestion is that Japan really needs to make a clear, unambiguous, forceful uh, apology to its neighbors in the way that Germany did in the decades following World War II. Um, and that if they do that, that they'll have a much closer relationship with South Korea, mainland China, and Taiwan. Unlikely with this party in power, right? Um, yes, that's true. Uh, and the party in power is going to be there for a long time. I mean, there was a, a brief moment when the LDP fell out of power, and people thought, oh, well, Japan is now on a new road, uh, but that turns out not to be the case. Well, very good. Well, certainly a story to watch. A lot of moving parts, as there always is. But I appreciate your coming out and talking with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. much. Was a viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 